welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm going to let everybody trickle in, but we've got a pretty packed agenda today with some really incredible speakers. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started basically right at one o'clock. I don't want to take away any time from our panelists. Um, I will give a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Firstly, today's session is being offered in both French and English. So if you would like to listen in French, um, please hover over kind of the icon bar at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, and there should be an icon that looks like a globe that says interpretation. Um, if you select this icon, it will prompt you to select French or English. Please select French and your audio should adjust to our live French interpretation. If you're having any technical issues today with the French translation or any problems hearing me or the panelists, um, please let us know by using the chat function, which is also one of the icons that appears at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, today, we will also be using the Q&A function for questions and discussion related to the content of today's webinar. Um, you can find that Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen as well. And we do have facilitators from Park People who will be monitoring these online questions. So we encourage you to please ask questions provide your own insights in the chat as we know there's a lot of knowledge and expertise here in our audience and we would just love to hear from all of you. If for any reason we do not get to everyone's questions today, which uh, because of our registration could be quite likely, um, we will try to get all of those questions answered after the session and share back the responses via email to everyone who registered for the webinar. I'll also note today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Park People's website for future reference. And we'll also share that link back out um, to all of our registrants. So thank you again for joining with us live today. Um, I'd now like to open today's webinar by acknowledging the land that we're gathered on and expressing our gratitude for its critical connection to the health of all. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and resilience of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people on this land. And we recognize their role as caregivers, stewards, and storytellers across Turtle Island. I am joining you today from Toronto, Ontario. And the city of Toronto is located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We are honored to be able to gather together today as we believe that parks should play a vital role in providing shared spaces for all people and our important space for reconciliation as well as decolonization. We invite you to introdu introduce yourself in the chat window with your name, organization, and what nation's territory you're visiting us from. If you don't know which nation's territory you live or work on, we encourage you to visit nativeland.ca or whose land, which we've linked both in the chat window. For those of you who are not familiar with the organization, or it's maybe your first time joining a webinar like this today, hello and welcome. Park People helps activate the power of parks to improve the quality of life in cities across Canada. Park People's national network provides comprehensive support to grassroots community groups, nonprofit organizations, and municipal staff across the country all that are working to animate and enhance their local green spaces. The network supports over 800 community groups and is the only network in the country dedicated to helping people do this type of work. Programs like this webinar aim to provide groups, 
organizations, and park professionals like all of you joining us today with the tools and inspiration you need to animate and improve your city's parks and public spaces with community in mind. I'm now pleased to pass it over to two of our experts joining us today, Clint Jacobs and Dr. Catherine Fabria, to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their work at the University of Windsor with the National Urban Park Hub. Over to you, Clint and Catherine. Hello, Ani Buju, can you hear us okay? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, I'll get things started. Um, it's a privilege to be here in uh, Windsor, Three Fires Confederacy Territory, and I'll tell you about a unique partnership with uh, Urban Parks and the University of Windsor called the National Urban Park Hub. Uh, next slide. We came into this relationship and this project because of National Urban Park Policy by Parks Canada to bring urban parks and Parks Canada get together using these three pillars of nature, uh, connection, and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Um, and so it includes like conservation and thinking about nature as a relation in cities. And we've used these and implemented and operationalized these pillars in all of the things that we do. Uh, next slide. For those that haven't been to Windsor um, and the river, Waiwayatsanong, um, the candidate sites that make up the National Urban Park um, candidate sites includes a number of different land parcels that include the Ojibwe Park, a provincial nature reserve, Ojibwe shores, and a number of other natural heritage features, including some of the only remnant tall grass prairie here in southwestern Ontario. Um, and we look forward to learning and connecting what we're doing here with a broader journey of creating national urban parks across Canada and beyond. Um, next slide. And so we've been doing this work and in relation to each other and the university and the different communities of practice that, we, that, that we've been working with over years are what really called us together to form a hub, um, a knowledge keeper table um, that's led by my colleague here, um, my own lab, the Healthy Headwaters Lab at the University of Windsor, as well as our uh, Cognate Lab city building, uh, focusing on the Windsor Law city, Center for Cities at the University of Windsor. And it was through community connections and showing up in community and in the parks that we all came together before um, the National Urban Park Plan and policy came together and Bill. Um, so these are the three key pillars. You can see they're really closely matched to the pillars of the program. So that's what we'll talk about um, here. Um, next slide. And so the work and the aim of our hub is to try and advance a couple of key things. Um, we want to advance reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and land. We want to co-create and learn with nature um, and really foster collaborative spaces. Um, and we'll do this by being on land together through aquatic and terrestrial um, monitoring and science and really try to understand and advance what Indigenous-led science could be in this context. Um, this will really help ground us in thinking about um, an Indigenous center co-located to the park. And, and we're on that journey to figure those things out um, in a good way. Um, our next slide. The other things we want to try and advance are is research to inform how can we do this within the context of a city? What does inclusive and sustainable city building look like and feel like? How can we make it equitable? Um, and how can that inform a whole network of national parks across the city and all, and all parks, all ways that we gather um, with nature? And ultimately, the role that we might play as a university hub is to try and increase knowledge about these wise practices, test them, co-develop them, and try to advance ideas for operations that will implement you know, our local community here in Windsor, but actually inform implementation in communities that are you know, really thinking about working together in a good way. Um, next slide. So, you know, the the different not tables um, that we have are the different pillars um, each have a, a lead and its own circle. Um, so I don't know, Clint, if you want to talk about uh, the knowledge keeper table at all and the plans or ideas there. Yeah, so that table is to help us uh, provide recommendations on ethical and wise practices and establish a long term advisory table um, of elders uh, for the proposed National Urban Park here in Windsor. Um, also create roles for cultural practitioners to help facilitate the reintroduction of indigenous culture, ceremony, languages, and other uh, into operations and programming, as well as co-create a vision and plan for an indigenous stewardship center. Next slide. 
And as the science provider in the hub, um, we have been monitoring and getting to know plant and animal beings and the habitats across the city. So we'll continue to do that. And we've really broadened our circle to include and train indigenous science practitioners and communities to do this work together, introducing not only just ecological monitoring, but cultural practices. So we can co-create what a monitoring framework could look like, um, especially if it's really focusing on ethical relations um, and, and really creates the training tools and approaches we might use in an indigenous led stewardship and conservation program. Next slide. Um, so our screen isn't big enough to have Center for Cities sitting here, but our third pillar, um, our colleagues in that space really have thought about and are really champion how does this fit as part of a larger city. Uh, Windsor is a, and the Windsor-Essex region is a really diverse population with so much history. Um, so how can we ensure that um, the park that we create benefits all of us? Um, and how can we identify and help support uh, ways to identify best practice or wise practice? So through the lens of um, nature connection and reconciliation. Um, so we're looking to do a lot of this work in community locally as well as nationally to inform operations. Um, next slide. So there's a lot of chatter and there's a lot of developments that have all kind of happened in the last year. And so there's a bill process and a policy plan and lots of um, very um, passionate people wanting to see this come to fruition. And if we can put to the next slide, I think the point of difference for the hub as a university trying to help and even on our own journey to really connect our work um, with the broader um, Windsor-Essex region. If you could put to the next slide, we really wanna focus on most of our work as re in relationship to one another. So the where you can find people involved in the hub is in the lab, whether they be crushing soil or um, on the wetland or doing walks to reconnect um, with different members of our community, connecting, for example, at the Park People Conference to find other communities of practice, as well as Parks Canada to, again, try to help where we can. Um, and again, like set an example, not only for what we wanna do here, but across other sites, and especially really focusing on the youth and empowering the next generation to take the lead and with as much support as we can offer. Um, next slide. Uh, so that's what I wanted to really highlight. Um, we really want to put into practice and operationalize these words that we know, these good words around nature and access and reconciliation using this National Urban Park opportunity um, and Windsor specifically to um, really see that and test some good solutions um, and connect with other people who are like-minded in their values. Um, and the next slide is, we just wanted to highlight that this is a work in progress. There's so many things that have come through our engagement about how we could do this from teaching and research and programming. And we've built a broad network within our community to support the next generation of, um, of, of our community to, to find and identify the kind of skills and community they wanna build through this opportunity. Um, next slide. So we really wanted to thank you um, and just uh, share with you the one um, additional thing, which is an endowment fund that we co-created together to try and create a mechanism for investing in the next generation of environmental guardians and stewards. Um, and so you can donate today. We're trying to fundraise to hit and set up an endowment fund that will uh, set us forth in perpetuity and invest in Indigenous youth to um, choose and pursue careers and training of their choosing. And um, you can find more information or stay in touch um, through the website link that will be shown and through the email on the screen. Thank you. Miigwech. Did you want to add anything? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. We'll hear more from them after this. Um, but I'm going to pass it now to Autumn Jordan and let them introduce themselves and their work at Nature Canada. Over to you, Autumn. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. My name is Autumn Jordan, and I organize Nature Canada's Bird Friendly City and Town Certification Program, which connects grassroots biodiversity advocates and municipal decision makers to protect, defend, and restore uh, bird populations in their communities, large and small. Um, I have a background and a passion in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology. And I am a lovely COVID year grad of a master's in ecological monitoring and assessment. I'm passionate about advancing bird conservation through on the ground education and community building. Next slide, please. And uh, the Bird Friendly City program was started in 2020. It's built on three main pillars. Uh, next slide, please. 
which is habitat protection and climate resiliency in our urban areas, reducing threats to birds in built environments, such as collisions with windows and vehicles, um, cat predation and pesticide use, as well as community outreach and education that, so folks have the tools that they need to save bird populations and biodiversity at large in their neighborhoods. Um, next slide, please. I currently work with over 60 grassroots teams campaigning for bird-friendly actions across the country. And right now there's a total of 24 certified cities and towns designated as bird-friendly, which demonstrates their commitment um, and passion for continuing to advocate and make progress uh, in urban biodiversity from a variety of different um, activities that folks can do. And um, out of these 24 cities, 14 of which were actually recognized at COP15, which was a very exciting moment um, for the coalitions working in their communities. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you more about it uh, throughout this presentation today. And if you have any questions or would like to learn more about the Bird Friendly City Program, I'll go ahead and put my contact info and the program websites in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone. Lovely, thank you so much, Autumn. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Dr. Rachel Buxton from Carleton University to introduce herself and her work. Great, uh, thank you so much. I'm I'm really humbled to be a part of this uh, panel of incredible speakers. Um, my name is Rachel Buxton. I'm, I'm a professor at Carleton U University at the Institute of Environmental and Interdisciplinary Sciences. We're located in Ottawa on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. So I have a background in ecology and ornithology. Uh, being from the West Coast, I fell in love with seabirds at a really young age, and I've been fortunate enough to follow them around the world, from Alaska all the way to New Zealand. These days, I run the Biodiversity Conservation Solutions Lab at Carleton University. So we're a diverse team. This includes uh, researchers, students, but also practitioners, government scientists, and policymakers. And we study the outcomes of urban conservation for biodiversity and how we can mobilize conservation solutions. So I'd like to give you a couple of brief examples of some of the projects we're working on at the moment, just to give you a flavor of, of the kind of science that we're doing in the lab. So I have one student who's exploring the outcomes of road closures in an urban park. I noticed some of you are, are calling in from Ottawa, so you might recognize Gatineau Park. It really is a special park located just outside of Ottawa. A lot of people recreate in the park and have really strong opinions about, about the park and, and about uh, you know, opportunities for access. Uh, but the NCC has now closed the main parkway for four days out of the week. They've also left some roads permanently open and they've permanently closed some roads to protect uh, particular wetland species like frogs and turtles. So a student in my lab has put out camera traps, acoustic recorders, and does daily roadkill surveys to explore how communities of mammals and birds are responding to these different road closures. Another project we're working on is looking at how effective window treatments are for preventing bird window collisions. So it's estimated that in Ottawa alone, 250,000 birds are killed by colliding with windows each year. Ottawa is a really important stopover site on the Atlantic Flyway. If you uh, equate this across Canada, this looks like more than 42 million birds every year are killed by colliding with windows. So Window collisions are a major source of bird mortality in the city. Some buildings have begun to treat their windows with bird-friendly dots or tape. You might have seen these around town, um, but these choices are often made by architects or city planners, and they don't meet appropriate standards. So one of my students is looking at how effective these different treatments are in preventing bird mortality. We're also interested in the link between health and biodiversity and making conservation more just in the city. So we're looking at the outcomes of community-led restoration, in particular a project in Detroit. 
where local communities that are facing really troubling levels of urban blight and environmental racism have been restoring derelict parks to native grassland. So we're teaming up with these community organizations and public health geographers at Michigan State University to look at the outcomes of these restoration projects for birds and how this translates to mental health benefits for local residents. So in general, at really large scales, our research is finding that birds are good for mental health. So as, a, as somebody who loves birds, that's not a particularly surprising result, uh, but really exciting to be able to share. So again, I'm really excited to be here and chat with you more about biodiversity in the city. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Rachel. And last but not least, I'm going to pass it over to Janet Sumner from Wildlands League to introduce her work. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being part of this uh, very good panel uh, today. I'm Jan Sumner, and I'm Executive Director at Wildlands League. I don't have any slides, so if you're waiting to see some, they're not going to be coming up. We are located in Toronto, where I acknowledge the land that I'm on has for thousands of years been the traditional home of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, it is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to work here as a treaty person. Wildlands is a conservation organization organization with a goal to protect 50% of Canada. We work from Windsor in the Great Lakes all the way through Ontario, right up to the north, working with the Meshkegawa people on their territory and other First Nations in the peatlands of the Hudson Bay and right into Hudson Bay where we're working on a new national marine conservation area. And we work across Canada on forestry and thinking through the lens of endangered species like caribou. Today, though, I'm here to talk about our work in the South, where nature is hanging on by a thread, where we must restore forests and protect fresh water as the foundation for a healthier future. We work in Windsor, Guelph, Pickering, London, and all across southern Ontario, where less than 2% of the land is protected. At Wildlands League, we are working on restoring nature's own rhythm so species, ecosystems, and people can coexist, frankly, so we can all thrive. We are working as part of a partnership across Canada with other groups uh, called the, uh, that are built around this Municipal Protected Areas Program. They are the Alliance of Canadian Land Trusts, BC Nature, Ontario Nature, Nature Canada, and of course us. This coalition is supporting municipalities across Canada to recognize or increase their protected areas or other effective conservation uh, measures. At Wildlands League, we're working to increase that protection in the cities that I mentioned, Windsor, Pickering. We want to see the Pickering Airport lands transferred to Rouge National Urban Park. In London, London and Guelph, we'd like to see new national urban parks. And frankly, across the greater Golden Horseshoe, where if we're going to restore life here, it's about building a network of protection that's interconnected and interwoven. It's really about rebuilding or re re reweaving that web of life. And one example has already been mentioned where we work is with the Caldwell First Nation in Windsor, which as Catherine mentioned, boasts uh, remnant prairie and savanna uh, grasses that are that is uh, the rarest Canadian ecosystem. In fact, we've dubbed Windsor as being the ecological hotspot. It's the hotspot for uh, flooding in Canada. It's a hotspot for endangered species, some of the most endangered species in Canada, and uh, the, almost the least amount of land protected. So we need to work here to actually rebuild that network of life. And common species that you'll see in the Ojibwe, uh, the proposed Ojibwe park are white-tailed deer and eastern chipmunk, et cetera. And so this native prairie grass is not only just good for species, but it also helps in terms of flood mitigation and droughts. Uh, we're really hoping to see uh, the Ojibwe uh, National Urban Park be created in the near future with Indigenous people in a co-governance model. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. That was great. Um, we're now going to move into the moderated discussion portion of this webinar. And so I'm going to again pass it over to Clint Jacobs, who's going to be the moderator for this portion. Um, Clint is an Indigenous knowledge connector at the University of Windsor. Through his appointment with the university, Clint leads field courses where students reconnect with nature 
through ecological monitoring and restoration projects across Walpole Island First Nation. The field course is offered to undergraduate students and aims to weave indigenous ways of knowing with Western ecological concepts. Clint is also the founder and director of the Walpole Island Land Trust, and as mentioned, has been deeply involved in work with Parks Canada in the creation of a national urban park in Windsor. He'll be leading the panelists through some questions, and then at the end, we'll follow with um, questions from the audience. Now I'm going to pass it over to you, Clint, to get us started. Thank you for that. Um, I want to welcome everybody. Um, thank you for taking part. We see that there's close to 400 or maybe more now uh, participating, so that's wonderful. Um, thank you for taking the time. I want to acknowledge Creator and all that uh, does in our lives and, and for the role that and responsibilities that he's given all of us to, to step up and be a voice and, and action. Um, those relationships that are so important uh, to sustain uh, all life, not just uh, for humans. So I want to start um, with some a following question, and this is for you, Janet. Um, one of the reasons um, we're gathered today is because we are in a year out from COP15 and want to check in around the progress of working, of work going on around biodiversity. Can you please briefly explain the concept of 30 by 30 and briefly what target 12 is from COP15. Target 12 focuses on green and <clears throat> blue spaces in urban settings. Um, a second part of that question is, and are ambitious targets like these helpful to your work or not? And in what ways? Thank you for the question, Clint. I really appreciate it. Um, let me just start with really uh, the state of the world. So we're at risk of losing some of the most important species and ecosystems in our lifetime. We are on the verge of the sixth mass extinction. That should concern everybody. And I know the world's focus is very much on the on climate change and the COP that's going on right now. But these two issues are linked. They are connected. Uh, as I just mentioned, Windsor has this tall grass prairie, which works like a sponge and creates climate resilience. But these ecosystems also absorb carbon. And so we should be thinking about both of these conventions as talking to each other. But I'm going to get back to the biodiversity one. To address the fact that we're losing species and ecosystems are collapsing, the world uh, gathered around and came to an agreement. 194 countries, in fact, have signed on to this 30 by 30, what gets shortened to. And essentially, that's this United Nations target where we've agreed to protect 30% of the world's land and oceans. It's actually the land and fresh water and oceans by the year 2030. This initiative, though, is part of a broader effort to address biodiversity loss, protect ecosystems, promote sustainable development, etc. The idea is to conserve a significant portion of the Earth's natural habitats and safeguard the biodiversity and ecosystem services there. It's again part of this convention on biological D diversity, the, the sort of the sister agreement to the climate convention. It should be noted though, that it is only a means to achieve what is actually the goal, which is to have a healthy livable planet that with thriving ecosystems. So you could go out and you could protect ecosystems and not achieve that. But this, this is about protecting 30%. And in fact, 30% is just the milestone on the way to what the science is saying we need, which is to protect 50%. But then we get to gold or to Article 12. It's not enough to protect 30% in these big areas. Like go out and protect great big areas and uh and we'll be done. We can just, you know, check, put a check mark there. But if the actual goal is to make sure that we have a healthy, livable, thriving world, it means we need to stabilize all ecosystems because they all are necessary. And we need to do that very specifically in the south, where, or what I would call not just the south, but the urban and near urban areas where we've settled, where we the most settlement, because those are the most imperiled. And we need to do that as well as protect the large intact areas. But those areas that are imperiled in the south, where we're in these urban and near urban areas, really need to have almost their own mindset or own approach. 
And in our urban and near urban areas, the task is to protect the last remaining remnants of nature that we have, and then connect those through ecological corridors and restored landscapes. We need to rebuild that web of life in the South. The monarch that migrates South needs refuge and food in our cities, as do the migrating buffalo heads that arrive here in the winter and live in the Great Lakes, and then they want to travel north to Hudson Bay for the summer. They need food and habitat. It is not possible to address biodiversity loss or achieve a more livable planet without a plan for nature in our urban and near urban areas. That's how it all works together. And I guess your second question for me, which I almost forgot in my, my answer to the first, is that I think these big targets do help. They can get glossed over. They can get left behind. We can just do a check mark, say, oh, we did two or three things. But I think you can see just by the gathering that we have here today that some of the funding that's been coming and some of the initiative and the imperative that's been coming from, from the federal government, quite frankly, because it hasn't yet hit in every single province. In some provinces, yes. You see magnificent work happening in Nova Scotia and British Columbia and in Quebec, frankly, but not in every province. And so the federal government has really been an instigator of getting some of this work going. And then I would say there's also a groundswell that's coming up. And that's one of the things that for me personally, I find very, very exciting is that when you get out into communities, they're going and you put a map down and you ask anybody, almost anybody who lives in a community, can you show me where we should be doing more protection? They can throw things down on a map and say, well, what about this area? What about that area? Or I know this area over here. And all of a sudden you've got a thousand ideas coming at you. And really what we need to do now is find a way to galvanize that and bring it all together because frankly, there are more people out there that want to do incredibly good work. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to move to um, questions for all the panelists. Um, we're going to start with Catherine. Um, um, so these questions relate to today's conversation was prompted by recent calls to, to action related to climate change that came out of COP15. However, we know that there are still many unmet actions from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. Uh, specifically around reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. The original stewards and caretakers of land recognized loss of biodiversity as being a, one result of colonization. Therefore, to start this con conversation off, I'm curious from each panelist, mm -hmm. how Indigenous ways of knowing or reconciliation show up in your current work? And if it doesn't, what efforts are being made to incorporate Indigenous ways of knowing and being in the future? Catherine? Um, I guess I want to say that it's it's it weaves through everything that I do. So I run a research lab at the university, um, but I've been on a um a longer journey for you know decades before I got to this moment, this idea of how do we connect to nature and how can I use you know the science gifts that I have and uh, me as an immigrant settler to Turtle Island displaced from colonial forces from you know my original country to here, and how can I you know, what growing up thinking about things like the ozone um, layer depletion and acid rain and all of these things, how can how how can I uh, move forward? And I think a lot of it came back to relating to nature as a relation as opposed to a resource. And so this every so when you think of it in that way and the positioning of um, relational work and a more relational science, um, indigenous ways of knowings have so much to teach uh, me and offer me. Uh, so I think I just operationalize it in everything that I do, you know, that everyone has um, opportunities to make connections personally. Um, we all have projects or jobs or communities that we're responsible to. And in this way where, you know, it isn't about science knowledge supremacy, it is about trying to be a better relation to this planet and um, really commit, you know, for me, what drives me is the next generation really trying to access and mobilize every tool I might have available in, in my toolbox or my tool belt um, to really raise and connect uh, human communities with the non-human ones. And science is one tool, one really powerful tool. And how can I use that in a way um, that is guided by uh, communities of practice and people who have like-minded values? So I think it's just a lot. I mean, me sitting with you and being in this community. Um, so I think just broadly, it's in everything that we do. And I do, you know, we do have the, TRC calls to action, there's other papers and other scholars that have written on what an ethical way looks like. So I do, you know, read and access and operationalize as much as I can and use it as a 
and sort of give myself grace to know that it's a practice and by finding and building good relations if there are mistakes or things that we didn't uh that didn't turn out the way we, we thought it would be there's a lesson in there and I think you taught me that <laughs> um so yeah so I, I'm happy to come back to it again but I do think um you know it, it doesn't start we shouldn't be motivated just because it's COP15 or just because there are these calls to action there is a journey and a conversation that precedes all of that and if you don't value it and don't understand why the connection with nature and that we're not separate from it, if that's still a conversation and you need to get to that, that, that has to happen first before we can actually talk about why we're mobilizing and trying to really scale local and global together. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I just, same question to you, Autumn, please. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing that. I um, wanted to build on what you said and also relate back to reading, always reading as a white settler on this land today. I can always have more to learn and improve upon. Just beginning with the TRCA's calls to action is a great place to start. Um, but overall in my work at Nature Canada, listening, supporting and amplifying indigenous voices on in our communities is critical to safeguarding nature and biodiversity, as well as um, supporting indigenous led conservation within our protected areas programming. In order to decolonize our uh, public programming. We focus on ways in which nonprofits have historically disenfranchised Indigenous people and actively work with um, these Indigenous communities and community groups to incorporate traditional stories and oral histories into our work uh, with the appropriate consent and back pra best practices for information sharing, of course. And on top of that, I've had the chance to learn um, recently about a framework called ethical space. So creating a place for knowledge systems to interact with mutual respect, kindness, generosity, and other basic values and principles um, with all knowledge systems being equal as Catherine mentioned um, has been really important to my work uh, when addressing urban biodiversity issues and climate change, because of course they are connected. Um, and keeping in mind that relationship building isn't and shouldn't be one-sided or extractive. Um, we should be working together with Indigenous communities to achieve mutual benefits to protect biodiversity. Um, and an example most recently in my work is we've developed an Indigenous advisory panel to develop a working group to share perspectives and alternatives to the colonial power structures when developing requirements um, within the program uh, within the Bird Friendly City program as it's particularly based on municipal power structures. Um, and yes, there's always, always more to learn and um, I'm always eager to do more research and incorporate um, indigenous knowledge and ethical space in my work and programming. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Rachel, on to you, please. Thanks, Clint. Uh Wonderful. And, and, you know, again, I'll, I'll echo um, what's been said and, and, and try and build on it. So as somebody who works in the academy on research, um, research has a really dark history um, of extraction uh, from Indigenous people and, and really everybody, uh, all communities. Um, so uh, we have a lot of, of uh, listening and learning and unlearning to do uh, in in the academy, and so um, part of of the work that I do with young people is trying to equip them with the tools to unlearn and and learn new ways of building relationships and and doing research ethically. Um, and so part of that is incorporating tools that have been built by Indigenous people into the classroom. So at Carleton, we have something called Indigenous Learning Bundles, where we can actually teach students from the undergrad level on how to do research in a good way and how to learn in a good way alongside communities. Um, so that's what it looks like in as far as teaching. And then as far as my own research, um, you know, Clint, you, you mentioned that, you know, Indigenous people are the original characters or, caretakers of the land since time immemorial, immemorial. and and our research is um you know it has found similar things that biodiversity is significantly higher on land managed by indigenous people so 
a lot of my research aims to support indigenous led initiatives in the city. Um, so providing science tools if needed, um, amplifying these programs that are led by indigenous people and also co-developing different projects so, you know, Autumn mentioned ethical space, which is a really wonderful tool. Two-eyed seeing is another tool that um, we try and use in our work. So um, making sure that knowledge systems coexist and interweave and we problem solve together rather than one knowledge system subsuming another one, which is another classic, uh, really big problem in the academy. Um, valuing Western science over indigenous science has, um, you know, been done for far too long. So really valuing these uh, two knowledge systems as equal and um, equally able to contribute to problem solving. That's all for me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and on to Janet, please. Yeah, thanks, Clint. And thanks, everybody else, for their incredibly uh, thoughtful answers. Um, I'm going to speak to um, just a few ways that I've, I've, uh, benefited from learning and by opening my ears and staying quiet and listening. And one of those is that um, very early on in my career as a conservationist, I had the chance to be um, schooled by uh, de uh, by the then Grand Chief uh, Stan Ludet for uh, the Meshkegwik Territory. And he taught me a very val valuable lesson, which is I'm a treaty person. We signed the treaties. So we actually have a responsibility um, to to work uh, as a treaty person in relationship with Indigenous people. And, and so that has changed, that shifted for me a great deal. The second was I was the co-chair of Canada's National Advisory Panel on how to protect 17% by 2020. And as that uh, co-chair, we received, again, a great lesson from Dr. Rich Crochu, who is a Blackfoot from uh, uh, the Alberta Territory. And he taught us ethical space, and he taught us um, how to work in uh, uh, this two-eyed seeing. And what he explained to us, which was a very simple way of seeing it, was that you have an Indigenous worldview and a non-Indigenous worldview. And your job is to actually bring those two together in an ethical way that you're having a conversation. And you're having a conversation between those two systems of knowing. And... The third, I would say for me, is that I've had chance to travel the land with uh, Indigenous uh, 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 guides. So we go up north to uh, land where there's not a lot of non-Indigenous people. We're traveling on the territory wow. of the Weenisk First Nation that are right on the coast of Hudson Bay. And Sam Hunter, who's been our guide for many, many years, he takes us out. We spend a lot of time in the community. We actually travel on the land we are not the people who know the most there. And that is abundantly apparent when you're dealing with polar bears and all the other kinds of things that you're out there dealing with. And you're listening to Sam tell the stories of the land and how he, he lives on the land. So that is when you get to really be humbled and you understand that you are not the knowledge keeper, not by a long shot. <laughs> and so if you're willing to open your eyes and your ears, you can actually learn a great deal. The other way that I've learned is, and and it's a continu it's a continuation. It doesn't just stop at you know. Oh, great, I got it. Because I just did a recent podcast with uh, uh, David Flood, who's a registered professional forester, is an indigenous, and he talked about. We were talking about forestry because we have this podcast called The Clear Cut, and he was talking very much about how it's important to do what he's calling, in terms of logging, doing the honorable harvest. In other words. Don't just take the hindquarters and all the meaty bits. You've got to take the nose and the tail, and you've got to use it all. Because if you're going to go in and log in a forest, you have to be respectful, and you're taking from the land and how you treat that, and it has to be honorable. So again, even on an extractive industry uh, idea, there was something there for me to learn. And I'm continuing to learn from Chief Duckworth in Windsor, working with the Caldwell First Nation and how they see the land there and how they're struggling to have just a place to do ceremony and a place for medicines, et cetera. So for me, this is about a state of mind and it's about constantly learning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, those are wonderful insights. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, I'm gonna, I've got a question for Catherine here. So 
Catherine, um, can we ask you to expand on the role of indigeneity in your work? Knowing that ecology and nature conservation in Canada have traditionally taken place through a colonial approach. And how can we work with indigenous partners and embed different ways of um, working hmm. into our work? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'll stick with that. Um, miigwech for that. I, um, I work with you. I work, I move out of the way and I practice humility and decenter the science in the relationships. And I think that's what we've been doing in relationship and on this journey together for a number of years. The first relationships I made when I arrived and was root myself with community and connect with, um, yeah, with, with the nature center um, and with it, we created um, Odemin, the indigenous knowledge circle within the group. So, you know, we, you can do anything. You can create whatever capacity you needed. And I, I wanted to start there um, knowing that I'm not indigenous to this land. So I think, again, through all of the things that we do, creating the spaces so that ethics and relationships are the priority and not the science. And science has emerged in a much more meaningful way because of that. And we were mo monitoring habitats here um, in urban parks and spaces and agricultural lands as well, because they are connected to the river and to the land. So I think again, moving forward with that humility, um, that cultural humility, which we talk a lot about wanting to do that first um, and knowing that, you know, the only way forward is through good relations and not an anti-colonial approach, uh, not a colonial approach. So I draw on, you know, anti-colonial methodologies, female-led methodologies. We have intergenerational leadership in everything we do. We have co-led leadership. We have wise practices. We've codified that in a lab manual, like each and everything that we do, we try to learn from and teach as much as possible um, how to be better connected. Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, so in addition and in parallel with our knowledge circle, we have a farm advisory board because we are sitting in a both urban and agricultural space and those, that's, those circles are overlapping uh, with non-Indigenous and Indigenous folks from this region. Again, wanting the, and the central thing is we all want to do better, do things together. We can get farther together and creating the spaces uh, to do that. So creating paid roles for the relational labor, all of the things that we know are important um, that didn't have roles, we created, we created them and spent as much time again out of the university and on the land and in the water um, to learn from, yeah, the non-human beings as well. So um, yeah, hopefully that gives you some idea. It does. And <laughs> we have another um extension to that question and, and it's um how how we set goals around election cycles for mm. 10 to 30 years opposed to thinking seven generations ahead yeah, yeah. and thinking about plants as a way to meet targets instead of regarding them as living beings yeah so again i'm a restoration ecologist and all of the science has shown that it's been generations of trauma that we've inflicted onto the planet and the habitats that we call and relate to and call home and likewise it will take generations for these relationships to be rebuilt again which i know is in uh, disjoint from election cycles. So this is why I focus on the next generation, you know, and that means, you know, getting plants in the ground, but also training the next generation so that they know that maybe this generation is about reconnecting with one another and getting some plants in the ground and knowing that who are, who do those plant or animal beings connect with? How does that water connect with that land? And so a lot of it is reconnecting. So our lab has a social media profile. We spend a lot of time, again, in community because the reconnection piece might be the goal for this generation um, and continuing to stay focused on, you know, while election cycles may change and these targets may move, we still want to pass on as much knowledge to the generation who is inheriting those choices as much as possible. So intergenerational leadership is really important, I guess, in that sense. Thanks. Great, Vince. Thank you. <clears throat> on to our next question. Uh, we've talked about inc incorporating diverse perspectives into biodiversity and climate change practice. Um, Autumn, can you speak to challenges of different partnership in this work and how we have overcome, or how you have overcome them and where you're heading now? Absolutely. Um, so in my work, uh, I work with a variety of grassroots environmental advocates, bird lovers, naturalists, uh, as well as municipal professionals and decision makers. 
Um, so with that, uh, these environmental grassroots groups across the country are all different sizes, mostly are coming into this as volunteers with other full-time roles. So capacity and time constraints can be a challenge for them, as can connecting volunteers um, to municipal decision makers just based on scheduling and the like. Um, so overcoming these challenges of course can be difficult, um, but making time in a busy schedule uh, can can um, be very fruitful for volunteers. We provide coaching resources to community groups on confidence building for presenting on biodiversity campaigns. Um, we host quarterly community of practices as a knowledge sharing for successes um, on those struggles that community groups and municipal professionals might be facing in regards to advancing bird conservation in their community. And then, of course, uh, we can maybe probably all relate to this, but staff changes, retention of volunteers and recruitment, or even burnout can also be tough to navigate. But through the Bird Friendly City program, uh, we've built it in such a way that each bird team um, working on certification uh, is multifaceted and includes, as I mentioned before, outdoors and hiking groups, um, community organizations, even private sector businesses, whether that's like a bird feed store or um, a bird-friendly coffee distributor, they can all come together to alleviate that workload from being on one individual's plate. Um, Additionally, Nature Canada offers small grants to advance efforts uh, in the community to become more bird friendly as well as honoraria because uh, we know that this work is important and that work deserves um, fair contributions. And um, on top of that, we also have um, some work planning sessions with new, new community groups and questionnaires uh, to help guide them in that work process if they're, if they're fear, fearing, uh, feeling overwhelmed um, by the vast knowledge of information. Uh, and I'm really looking to hearing what the other pan panelists have to say in regards to um, stakeholder challenges and partnerships in, in the other sectors of work. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Rachel, in your work, what are the unique challenges and opportunities for improving bio biodiversity in cities? Thanks, Clint. Yeah, that's uh, something that I we do a lot of thinking about, both myself and my students, the idea of challenges and opportunities and trade-offs and synergies for biodiversity conservation in the city. Um, I'll start with the challenges and I'll end uh, more positively with the opportunities. So, um, you know, urban environments are very, very challenging for most wildlife. You know, I'm, I, I'll start with birds because that's my, my expertise, but you've got highly altered habitats, uh, high habitat fragmentation, tons of threats. You've got light pollution, noise pollution, you've got windows. Uh, you've got cats, uh, so huge number of threats. Um, often we think of cities as population sinks for sensitive species. We can even create ecological traps in the city. So just to give you an example, um, often we'll restore edge habitat in the city. It's really great for birds. They love the, the complexity of an edge habitat, lots of shrubs, grass, trees, different habitat types. Um, but the other thing that likes edge habitat are outdoor cats. So often, uh, you know, we'll re restore edge habitat, we'll lure birds into this, this wonderful nesting habitat and, and only to get obliterated by um, outdoor predatory cats. So, you know, these, these landscapes have been altered for many hundreds of years and um, often it's really challenging to manage all threats and to uh, restore habitat for, for wildlife. Another huge challenge for improving biodiversity in the city is that biodiversity is only one priority in an urban setting. Uh, there's also, you know, people's needs and uh, there's a lot of people in the city. So if you think of a park and how it's being managed, often one of the, the primary mandates is to increase recreation or increase use of the park, um, which may go to the detriment of 
certain wildlife species that are really sensitive to um, disturbance. So um, biodiversity conservation is only one objective and priority in, in a city. So just to give you an example from my work in Detroit, um, there are huge swaths of vacant land in Detroit. Uh, in some places in the inner city, it's as high as 75%. So this is vacant land where houses have come down and just random vegetation has grown up. These vacant lots are very bad for people. Uh, it's seen as a sign of urban blight. It can foster crime. People are scared of them. Birds love them. So it's prime bird habitat. And so the city is now introducing a tax for people who own vacant lots if they don't mow them. And you can probably guess what happens after these vacant lots are mown. They're, they're not good for birds at all. So you have these trade-offs, right, in a city. Um, biodiversity is just one priority. All right, so now let's talk about opportunities. Uh, cities are a great place for biodiversity conservation to get people involved in conservation. 70% uh, of Canadians live in the city. So for 70% of Canadians, this is their primary opportunity to be involved in conservation and to experience green space and biodiversity. So uh, restoration or conservation in the city is a prime opportunity to connect people to nature. People make decisions in the city and that reverberates really across the world. So we have an opportunity to connect with people and understand sort of what decisions they're making and, and how we can reconnect them with nature. Um, I think that's all for me. Um, I'll hand it back and I'd love to hear from others, their perspectives as well. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> This next question is um, going to be to all the panelists, and we're going to start with Catherine. Um, to everyone, Catherine said that uh, when planning this webinar, we all have gifts. We all have something that we can do. Uh, so the questions are, how do we determine what is our specific piece of the biodiversity puzzle? And what are some easy, inexpensive, barrier-free activities for the average person to undertake? Do you know who told me that quote, Clint? That was you. <laughs> um, that's like teachings that um, this idea that we all, you know, there's one way to do, choose a path, but ultimately the path that we should choose is the one that speaks to the gifts that we've been blessed with. So I don't know if you want to talk about that, Clint, but that's what I use as my kind of guiding light for finding and mentoring the next generation. So I don't know. Do you want to? Just real, real briefly. Um... This, this idea of having gifts, we're all blessed with them. And, and um, sometimes, you know, when we have to try to draw this out of youth, we have to ask them um, sometimes if they don't know what their gifts are, talk to their close friends or cl talk to people that know them well, maybe their parents or grandparents, um, to help explore that, that, that the ideas that the Creator blessed them with. We all have these different gifts and, and um, to kind of go forward on a path that's meant for us and utilizing those gifts to share them and to grow them. Um, anyhow, so that's really what that was about. Yeah, and so I guess as someone who journeys with you it's and co-mentors uh, young people, some are very creative and there's a space for that. We need to connect with people and find ways that nature is a really creative place. We are inspired in lots of different ways. Um, again, like some people are very technical and want to, you know, know how to do a certain tool. So again, connecting them with other knowledge connectors or people or knowledge holders or researchers or communities um, to build that up. And for me, the role is to try and connect their connect them with their path. And and I think when it comes to biodiversity and um, and in a city. I think it is trying to encourage us to do that relational work within ourselves, but then also be really, um, I guess, just be really open to everyone's path. We're all on different journeys. Some of us are on healing journeys. Some of us are reconnecting with culture or, or disconnected from it. There's a lot of people, you know, these are lots of complex places that we live in, um, but, you know, encouraging people to, um, nature has been good medicine. I think we learned that from COVID. So I think the idea that we find ways to 
really figure out who we are in this space, how we can help and connecting with those communities is something that I feel like you've taught me. And so, and it's a lesson that keeps being re remind that I just revisit that and relearn that all the time. So um, yeah, I don't know if other people have other things and gifts that they want to share. Yeah. So that, that, and maybe think of just an example, if you don't quite follow around that idea of gifts, um, people might have a gift of gab. And so if they're working in your organization, you want them to be the people that are connecting with people, just having these natural conversations, it's just going to come out naturally for them. Um, so I'm going to pose that question to Autumn as well. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll I think I'll go with what you said there, Clint, of the gift of gab. I really love talking to people about birds um, and opening up their minds to the ways that they can protect birds in their communities. Uh, so getting folks out into nature and in in a urban setting is one of the first ways that I try to help people along that journey, um, taking them on one of my favorite hiking spots or just a park uh, and go birding together, let them borrow my binoculars since, you know, those do have a heavy investment. Um, but I think to first care about nature and biodiversity, we have to be connected to it and want to protect it. So if folks maybe are afraid or uneasy about the outdoors, um, meeting them where they're at and where they're comfortable and finding out where their passion lies can be really important. Um, one of my favorite sort of low cost ways that folks can get involved with birding and community science uh, is eBird, of course. Um, you can get these apps on your phone. eBird is wonderful. The Merlin app can help you learn um, different types of birds through song in your neighborhood um, and iNaturalist is a way that you can um, have a community online to help learn about and uh, like plant identification it's mostly focused on plants uh, but one of my other favorite examples from my work here at Nature Canada is We've helped a few communities uh, have birding backpacks through their libraries. I know Birds Canada has a similar program as well. So folks can rent out a birding kit, a birding backpack uh, for free through their library. It includes a set of binoculars, you know, a guidebook uh, and the like. And I, I find that that's one of my, my favorite ways to keep um, the momentum and positivity going. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, Rachel, same question, please. Thanks. And I, this is such a beautiful question. So thank you. I, I really appreciate thinking about this more, actually. And not to go all researcher on everybody, but one of my favorite pieces of research shows that the ways that people make decisions is predominantly based on the decisions that people are making around them. And so I think about this all the time in what I do and just trying to embody, uh, you know, connectedness to nature and, and moving forward with solutions. So just to give you an example, where we live in Ottawa, we put decals on all of the windows uh, to prevent bird window collisions. And now there are four people on our block that also have... <laughs> decals on their windows. So doing the doing things for conservation, people see that um, and it perpetuates more action. So never think that the things that you do are too small um, and always make them visible. People are so interested um, and just being the change. So another example, uh, I, I started a conservation club at Carleton, sort of sheepishly thinking that nobody would want to be involved. And one of our first projects is to get more decals on windows at, at Carleton. And like 40 grad students showed up to our first meeting. So people want to be a part of this stuff, right? Um, and just showing them how, giving them opportunities and, and doing it yourself so they can see that there's there's a path forward is really important. And again, on connecting people with nature, you know, um, I went and, and gave a talk at my son's school. He has an animal club at school and I just talked about birds and, you know, immediately everybody, you know, like, wanted to put binoculars on their Christmas list. And, and it's like, it doesn't take much. It just takes a really small conversation to really spread 
um, this around the excitement, the connection and the action piece. So just being being present and, and doing things for biodiversity conservation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Janet. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, I would say uh, for us and, and the way that we work, trying to get more um, uh, municipal areas that are protected or counted, what we do is um, we actually often start with a way to connect. And so, for example, Rouge National Urban Park for you know many years, people have been trying to get it protected as a national urban park. And we decided to go in and build a big political momentum around this. And that was a way to draw attention and make it very popular. And so it got a lot, a lot of media attention, but it brought out a lot of people because that Paddle the Rouge, we made it free for uh, families. And uh, we did it in such a way that we promoted it into the broad diversity of communities in, in Toronto. So we had, I would say, 90% was non-white that came out to our events. And we made it uh, something that was very much run by volunteers. So that meant you had people with all different kinds of gifts. You had people who had skills at writing media releases, people who really liked to uh, think about what the art was in terms of putting up a, a tent or creating a display or people who are really good teachers who could work with youth and teach them how to paddle or people who could actually be almost like loners because they wanted to go out there and set up the stage for when you arrived at this area, this and this would be happening. So it meant that we attracted a wide array of people who all brought their skill sets and we did that. And we're currently thinking through what does that event look like in Windsor? What does it, what does it, how do we galvanize the people and the energy that is there and actually bring it out and put it up and, and amplify it and make it be the voice of the people so that people want to see their area protected. And I liked what Rachel was saying. So that gives me encouragement for the fact that I don't mow my front lawn, that people will just have to put up with it. It also saves me a lot of time, but it looks great. Or at least that's what I think. So I think that there's this idea that by doing things and being visible and creating opportunities for people, you just, there is so much energy out there. People love nature. What happened during COVID? We all wanted to get out in nature. And that means we actually have to have more of it because we need to have more access to larger areas. And in our cities, if we're going to actually ever hope to deal with climate change, we need to have more nature as a natural resistant against the uh, things that are coming from climate change, whether it's heat or floods. Thank you for that. Um, again, for panelists, um, just to a brief response, please. Um, climate change and biodiversity, biodiversity loss are heavy subjects. Um, I'd like to ask everyone, I'm going to start with Catherine. What is the significance of hope or optimism within your work? And how would you encourage others to su start supporting urban biodiversity? and crucially to keep going. Yeah, thank you, Miigwech. Um, I guess just thanking all of our panelists, it's been really inspiring listening to you. I think what gives me hope is knowing that we are a community. Um, and I think also, you know, as hopeful as we are and as connected as we already are to nature, I think a, a lot about that our access to nature isn't equitable in cities. And I do think about as a, you know, I, I literally was a kid from Scarborough that and, and grew up in different places around the world and access to nature and water isn't always easy for people uh, or less able people. Um, and so I do think, I know it is really hard, but I think there are pockets of awesome everywhere, finding your community. And again, this human, like not, you know, not taking for granted um, that we have a river, like we can see the river from our window and that we have the opportunity to connect with nature at every opportunity. And so I think the vision, especially with the National Urban Parks hub, hub work as we engage is to reach people who aren't already in relationship with nature because of the ways that cities have been built to separate us from nature or different communities to connect with nature or don't have access. Um, and so I do think that's an important thread. It, it, there's lots of hope. Um, and I guess the difference is that I can't predict, and that's what maybe is the transformation, is I don't know for sure how this is going to go. But I know that in good relations, we are transforming the structures that we're in because we're finding a different way to work together. So what gives me hope are days like this um, and, and events like this, where we all have a different organization or community, but we can at least know that we're not doing it alone. Um, and that nature is a, a good medicine and a connector for climate change and flooding and all of the things that we think are 
you know, actually human driven um, issues. So yeah, I have a lot of hope and being here today is is one of those reasons Miigwech for that question. Thank you. Um, on to you, Autumn, please. Thank you. Yes, this is definitely something that I struggle with for sure. Um, eco anxiety, eco grief can be tough topics. So for me, um, the ways that which I stay optimistic is to be inspired by folks such as the other panelists on the call today. Um, and when I see new decals getting put up, that is what um, inspires me and keeps me going, as well as uh, working with groups who are on the ground, you know, um, fighting against certain developments, taking those wins, taking those losses, and being inspired by their work uh, is what really motivates me. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Rachel? Thanks, everyone. I just want to echo what everyone said about finding your finding your people, the, the pocket of the awesome. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I look to other people doing amazing things like everyone on this call. Um, for me, hope is action. Hope is is solutions. And um, I just get hope uh, from doing whatever I can. And for me, hope is watching communities do what they can. So taking inspiration from these amazing groups like many people um, who are participating in this webinar um, online you know 321 of you um, probably all doing really amazing things in your own corner of the world so that's really inspiring um also young people you know i i'm a prof i work with with young people who've all probably gone to school during COVID gone to university during COVID and they've come out resilient and enthusiastic and passionate about making the world a better place and what's more inspiring than that you know these young people who are gonna make the world a better place and you know also my my kids you know the, they're growing up in in a, a really uncertain world and yet you know they're they just uh, bring so much joy so yeah, young people, communities, and like-minded folks like are on this call. Thank you, and Janet. Yeah, I'm just gonna tell a brief story. Um, so maybe a decade ago, we didn't have any national urban parks and uh, people said it couldn't be done. In fact, there were all kinds of people arguing against it, including some people at the federal government said it couldn't happen because you couldn't embed ecological integrity into any kind of legislation. And ecological integrity means that you're going to be improving the ecological integrity of that area over time. That's what it's measured against. Um, it was said, it's absolutely impossible to do. Well, guess what? We actually wrote legislation, got it into into it, made it hugely popular. And we we chose Rouge as our kind of our poster child. Yes, because there was a lot of work that had gone in there, but it was also accessible to 7 million Canadians, which is 20% of the population. So you could make national urban parks really popular, really fast by focusing on one thing. Now, today we have a promise by Parks Canada and the federal government to create 15 national urban parks. We've already seen one popping up in Halifax. We've seen the work happening in Windsor. We know that uh, Edmonton is interested in one. We've got uh, other areas of the country. In fact, we're inundated by groups that are calling us and saying, hey, I want to get a national urban park. How do we do it? We've got a new press release, I think, coming out very soon around um, one in Guelph. We see people in, in London starting to rise up. Literally right across this country, people are trying to figure out, how do I get one too? And I think that that gives me hope is that if you can create a really good example, make it popular, show people how it can be done, then other people go, great, I'm going to go out and do it. And what we've also seen with um, Rouge is that it's it's not just about, hey, great, we got a new national urban park, but now people are trying to make it bigger. And the other thing that happened was when a politician tried to touch it by saying we're going to do development in the green belt everybody went nuts. And that gives me a lot of hope because it was like, don't touch Rouge. Do not touch it. You can't touch it. And you can't touch the green belt. And we're going to keep the green belt. You have to do it. That was the power of the people to actually make a, 
a definite improvement on that. And then I'll just finish with this last piece, which is in terms of Rouge, one of the things that they've been doing, because there's resources and there's an ability to go out and actually count things, the work that they've done is they've now, it used to be we thought there was maybe like 16, 1700 species there. We now have documented proof that there's over 2000 species in Rouge National Urban Park. That is crazy. So yes, it might not be all the habitat that everybody needs and all the rest of it. So we have to make it bigger. We have to transfer the Pickering Airport lands to Rouge to make it 20% bigger. We have to keep making everything bigger. We have to keep making it connected. But there's so much love for this. There's so much love for this. So I encourage everybody to keep going. Thank you all panelists for that. I, I want to add some thoughts around that last question myself. Just made me think about um, how we encourage others and and. and I was inspired by a friend out in BC, um, Carrie Trebasket, and, and she um, started bringing young people to events that that they weren't accustomed to. So they, you know, we, we we've got a lot of like-minded folks here, um, but we need to kind of draw in folks that have not been exposed to that, and particularly young people. And so everywhere she went to give a talk, she brought along some young person and encouraged them to kind of share their own feelings and thoughts and. and get these people involved. Um, the way I think about keeping this momentum uh, going is I recently kind of reflected on my own people's um, uh, prophecies and, and just to kind of re-inspire myself and then looking at the seven fire um, prophecies and, and how things are being prophesized to go bad for us, but also good if we, if we be intentional about our work and step up and not just wait for things to happen. We need to, to keep going. And so that helped me kind of re-motivate re, um, myself and, and looking at these things. Um, I'm gonna share a real quick story um, about um, nature and, and how sometimes people are, are afraid of it. And, and I had a friend that, that had this young boy that, that was pretty intimidated by nature, didn't like being outside. Um, and I was just trying to find ways to encourage her to um, keep slowly bringing him, exposing him to nature and helping him um, find connections in his own way. Just a young boy. They were sitting at this picnic table and they, um, you know, just slowly getting into parks, getting into places where he felt comfortable, felt safe. And they watched this bee kind of flying in kind of um, awkwardly and it landed on a table and he was about to bolt and take off and run. Um, and she, and Something that I learned from elders, and I was trying to encourage her to use this with her son, was I was asking, um, what do you learn from this, from the different situations that you experienced? And so he was walking around, but she calmed, down, calmed him down and asked him to, to be still and just watch the bee. Um, and then it was there grooming off. It was just covered in pollen. It was just this pollen ball. ball. And, and it started peeling some of the pollen away off his wings and off his legs. And, and then it just took off in a nice straight bolt. Um, a line up into the sky and she reflected on those um, cues that I, that I asked her uh, to utilize and, and that I learned from elders in my own community on how we guided the education of young people and so she asked him what did you learn from that and his response was was just really hit me he said you don't take more than you need and those are one of my people's laws um you don't take more than you need and he learned it from a bee he didn't learn it from me or from another indigenous person so if we uh, can bring um people to nature we're going to learn a lot and it's going to inspire them to kind of find their role and their connections so miigwech everyone thank you so much for sharing everybody and clint that's a, a really great note to leave us off on um, deeply appreciated of that. Uh, and I think also what leaves me with some hope and optimism is this community that's joined, like Rachel said, we had over 700 people register for this webinar showing that this is a topic folks are really interested and passionate about. And we had over 400 people join us today in a really busy time of year. So that's really great to see. Um, we're going to turn it over for um, an audience question. Um, we don't have a ton of time, but I do want to get to this question, acknowledging that we don't have any municipal staff on this panel or in this room, um, but they do play an important role. 
So Karen McKendry asked, um, municipalities in Canada do not seem to have a legally mandated responsibility to work on biodiversity. How have the panelists today found ways to frame biodiversity work in such a way as to appeal to municipalities so that they can work with them? Does anybody uh, want to start with that? And we don't all have to respond, but um, I'd like to just put it out there if any of the panelists want to take a shot at that question. I'm happy to start. Oh, yeah, I found, thank you. I found one way to, um, if you will, get the biodiversity message across to municipalities and councillors is either um, working with an environmental advisory committee uh, as part of the municipality, which usually has a few councillors sitting um, on the committee, as well as residents. And that can be a really good way for residents to be able to raise their concerns about biodiversity to their municipality and propose um, specific measures to take action, whether that's to prevent a certain development from going through, a clear cut, uh, wastewater treatment or the like, as well as um, deputations to council. Anyone can give a deputation to council for a specific ask. It's just all about getting in touch with the city clerk um, and making sure you can stick to their time limit. So I would encourage folks to speak up um, and speak out at city council meetings when they can about um, pertinent biodiversity issues. Thank you. It's a great call to action. Thank you. And, and now everybody has their hand raised. It's great. Um, I'll pass it to Clint and Catherine first because I think they were first. Um, yeah, no, I want to hear what everyone else has to say. But <laughs> I, I guess I just wanted to say we work really closely with the city of Windsor. And I just wanted to shout out um, the Ojibwe Nature Center, Karen Cedar, um, just the team of people who value partnerships and know that there's something that a university can do. And likewise, members of our team at the hub include former city councilors. So I think the fact is we have to work together. There's, you know, biodiversity folk need uh, to work in partnership with our co-governance, our First Nation communities, our urban Indigenous communities, all communities, and figure out the ways in which things are pieced together. Um, so, you know, the scientists can do the science measuring, but again, finding ways to, to connect. But I do want to say that we've had a really, a real privilege in having um, a city, a municipal government that has created spaces and roles and Indigenous guide positions and, um, you know, given an in-kind space for us to have some of the first Indigenous land-based teachings events for youth. So they are, there are things that um, the city can do if there's, if there's will and interest in, and hopefully if they're, you know, we had more than two or 300 people at the first Indigenous Teachings event um, that the youth ran just a few weeks ago. And I think that just hopefully shows the rest of the city that there's interest in Will and, and hopefully it'll just continue to build because that all they kept asking the community members is when's the next event. And, and I hope that that bodes well for more connections to come and we couldn't do it without our city partners. So thank you. Awesome. And I think Janet, do you want to share next? Uh, sure. Uh, so I would say that every city is a little bit different. Some of them do have it in their official plan, kind of like uh, Toronto does, but some have, you know, vegetation cover, some have uh, climate change as a, you know, you can see cities that have huge problems with climate change, whether it's heat event or flooding or things like that, and they're trying to reduce it. So looking for um, that crack in the system where you could actually go in and start exploding more uh, protection and also making areas that are natural areas really popular and 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 show that for a counselor, they might want to take that on because it's like, oh, this is in my backyard. This is actually really good for my constituents. Think about them as politicians because they are. So what do they want to actually see get protected is usually something that they think is going to be good for their constituents. And so trying to find ways to make some of those connections. And then what we've found is that in most municipalities, well, the other uh, funny thing is that some municipalities are like very, very excited about national urban parks because it means somebody else is going to pay for it. Um, so, <laughs> you know, because it's going to be the federal government who will come in and they'll run these programs and and all of their community will benefit. So sometimes it's really simple things like that that just make it. But we're everywhere. People who care about conservation are everywhere. They're sitting at city council, they're inside the departments, they're they're all over the city. And so it's finding those people who are like-minded, who want to work on the work that you're doing, and that might see the world from your point of view, 
go out and find them, meet them, have a conversation, whether you hold a an information night or whatever, but there's there's so many avenues into cities and so many people who are interested in it, even if they're not officially uh, enabled by it. And then I'll just finish with um, the Municipal Protected Areas Program that's funded by Environment Canada and Climate Change is actually trying to go out and talk to cities about signing on to 30 by 30. And we won't protect 30% of the land in the city, but cities can do their part, which is, again, the part that they have to do is to help recover these ecosystems and bring back biodiversity because you can't just protect 30 by 30. That will be ridiculous. We just won't have a livable planet then. So what we need to do is actually we need to engage cities to be part of it in the same way that many of them have already signed on to climate uh, objectives around net zero. So can we start to get our city signed on to this? And that's part of the work that we're doing with this Municipal Protected Areas Program. Thank you. Fabulous. And Rachel? Thanks, Laura. And thanks for the question. So I just wanted to speak to some of our research looking into uh, management of species at risk of extinction in cities. So we're actually finding that there are large numbers of species at risk where their critical habitat falls almost exclusively within municipal areas. Um, and this, this point you raise about most municipalities not having a biodiversity plan is, is really salient. And there's a couple things on that. So part of our research is looking at what leads to successful management of species at risk in the city. And there seems to be two essential elements. One of them is political will, but the other is community engagement and community, the amount of noise and, and action that a community takes, which then feeds back up into political will. So it's, it's sort of a, a, a circular process uh, where community engagement improves political will. And so having both of those elements is really key to successful species at risk management in a city. The other thing is that even though a municipality might not have a plan for biodiversity conservation, there are local parks that do. So, um, you know, Stanley Park has a, a management plan for species at risk, for example. And those plans that are more specific to local parks actually feed back up into municipal policies. So um, things that are more at the grassroots level often feed back up. Um, to the political level. So just wanted to mention those couple of things. Thank you, that's awesome. And um, we're gonna have to close off just for the sake of time. We have some incredible questions in the chat, some challenging questions um, that we will pose back to the panelists and send out responses to afterwards. But I think that this has been such a great conversation um, with some amazing panelists. So I wanna just thank them again for their time, for sharing their passions and their insights. Um, it was so amazing. Um, so I also wanna extend uh, an a thank you and acknowledge um, our funders for today's webinar and acknowledge that it was made possible by the generous support of an anonymous donor, the Hillary and Galen Weston Foundation, TD, Arcteryx, and Parks Canada. These types of events simply could not be possible without our funders. And before we sign off, um, next slide please, I just wanna share some exciting news from Park People. We are launching a Park Professional Network. So Park Professionals, we know need new ways to plan, design, manage, program, govern, and fund city parks. And so if you work in government or at a not-for-profit or in an academic institution, or even in the broader urban planning sector, we wanna work with you. So you can join our park professional network by subscribing to our newsletter and checking out our new space on our website. You can get the inside scoop on professional opportunities, trainings, and fee-for-service work that Park People is offering just for you. The link to join our Park Pro newsletter along with the general newsletter is gonna be put in the chat um, as, as well as the link to our new space on our website for Park Pros. Next slide, please. Um, and if you enjoyed this webinar, we invite you to follow us on our various social media pages to stay tuned for other webinars, events, publications, and grant opportunities offered by Park People.
I want to again thank everyone for coming and spending the past hour and a half with us. We will follow up with the link to the recording, again, with some resources, as well as some responses to the questions we didn't get to today. Um, we really want to continue this conversation, con continue this optimism and this work towards um, enhancing our biodiversity in urban settings. So please stay in touch and everyone have a very happy Thursday. Thank you all for coming and thanks again to our wonderful panelists and experts. Bye. Thanks to Park People for organizing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everyone.